they find out who this truly this Jesus Christ really is who we worship at this time of the year who came and was born in a manger but Lord I pray that you would just do great things here this morning and we ask that you would bless your word be it read be it sung be it preached, Lord uh, uphold your word Lord and use it in a powerful way to build up Saints and to save sinners we ask and pray this in Jesus name Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Please stand. We're going to sing praise to our God. We're going to start with a well-known Christmas carol. This one is O Come All Ye Faithful. next song is God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Deep in unfathomable 
song is Lamb of God.
Please be seated. You want to take your Bibles and turn to our consecutive reading through the Old Testament. We find ourselves in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk and chapter 3. Habakkuk, however you want to pronounce it. For our scripture memory this week, we had asked if you could memorize Romans 1 and verse 18. And Romans 1 and verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So for next week, we would ask that uh, you consider memorizing Isaiah and chapter 9 and verse 6. And it is, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So if you could memorize that for next week, that would be fantastic. Catechism question is number 12. And it says, and what does God require in the ninth and the tenth commandments? And the answer to that is, the ninth, that we do not lie or deceive, but speak the truth in love. And the tenth, that we are content, not envying anyone, or resenting what God has given them, or us. And for next week, it's consider number 13. Can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Old Testament, Habakkuk, chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Zhiganeth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Tenman, Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, Selah. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Median did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It's lifted, it lifted its hand on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit tree on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls yet. 
I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the, the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Some days we think this world is in an utter turmoil and chaos because of everything that's going on around him. But everything that Habakkuk is speaking of here is the Lord working out vengeance against many of the wicked, the things that he's doing, the chaos that seems to be around everywhere. The Lord's directing it all for his purpose and towards his end and his goal. But what we're looking for is to have the faith of Habakkuk in those last verses, to trust in the Lord, the God of his strength, and nobody else. Even though there's nothing happening that seems good, there's no fruit on the vines, there's no flocks in the fields, there's nothing. And yet he says, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's and he makes me tread on my high places. Let's rejoice in that God. The same God that Habakkuk was speaking about is the same God we worship today. In the confusion of this world, God is in charge, and we can trust him, and we know that. Let's depend upon him and him alone. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, in this world, it seems like it's total confusion. Probably for some of us, even in our own lives, it seems like it's confusion, that things aren't going right, and we have no control over situations that are occurring within our own lives. And yet, Lord, help us to be like Habakkuk and just trust in you. You are our strength. You are the one who, who will uphold us. And you are the one that is working out all things, Lord, to your honor, to your glory. Be it good, bad, or otherwise, Lord, that you have ordained it all. And for what purpose, we sometimes do not know. But we trust you, Lord. And we ask that you would revive our faith and give us the ability, Lord, to look to you to look to the one who has procured our salvation, who has brought us into fellowship with yourself, and that through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in that, Lord. We rejoice in the fact, Lord, that you have opened up your word to us and you have shown us the truth of your teaching and that you have granted us the ability, Lord, to come to know who you truly are. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all that you have done for us. And we pray that we would, Lord, through your power of your spirit, continue, Lord, to lean on you and trust in you, and that we would be a testimony and a witness to those around us as well of your goodness and graciousness to us as well. Lord, I pray the same for the children of this congregation. There are many here, Lord. And we plead with you that you would awaken their hearts to the realization of how good and kind and loving you are. And that you would show them that love through your son, Jesus Christ. That you would awaken their hearts, Lord, to the reality that they need a savior. They need one who can intercede before them, before your throne of grace as well. So, Lord, we plead with you that you would do great things. And even in the nursery children, Lord, save those young ones, Lord. Draw them into your kingdom and make them, Lord, a trophy of your grace as well. Lord, take the gifts that we will be giving now as we take up an offering. Use those, Lord, as a means to uh, expand your kingdom here on this earth, to continue the ministries that are existing but also, Lord, to reach out and to share with those who are in need and need help in their ministries and their, their uh, programs that they have going as well. So help us all, Lord, as a congregation uh, and as individuals to truly give cheerfully 
to you what you have so graciously given to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is God's word. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they were glad when they divide the, st the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is God's word. Thanks be to God for it. Let's pray and then we will unpack this glorious text. Father, we pray this morning for your blessing upon us. We need it. We need it more than we probably even realize. Thank you that you are the God who is light and the God who gives light. And may it shine upon us this morning. We think of Paul's words and his own experience on the road to Damascus of how you in your mercy put him into darkness and then you shined your light upon him. And that light was your gospel revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, that's what we need this morning. Unbelievers, Lord, need that converting light. They need to see, Lord, that their only hope in this dark and muddled world that is characterized by depravity is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would shine in their hearts and show them your glory in the beautiful, wonderful face of Jesus. But, Lord, for us who are believers, Lord, we also need that light. Lord, some of us feel like we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, would you also shine upon us? And would you lead us and would you guide us by the light of your countenance? Father, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit, the agent, Lord, of bringing light out of darkness, the agent of bringing life out of death, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be at work in our midst. We need you, Father. And I pray this morning that we would receive, perhaps for the first time or for the thousandth time, this gift, Lord, that is free to us and yet was a great expense to you, your son, this child who embodies your love and your mercy and your grace, this sign of a son. Father, would you give us the faith necessary to even receive him as we ought. And Father, make sense, Lord, out of our confusion. Bring light out of our darkness. Bring joy, Lord, to our despairing hearts. Father, show us Christ. 
from the text, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, we continue on from our last week's study in Isaiah 7. Perhaps you recall, or if you were not here, I will remind you that this is a section to be read in its entirety, chapter 7 through 9, or if you're a really diligent student, chapter 7 through 11 and into 12. And we're going to see that chapter 9 builds upon what we learned from chapter 7, where we had the context of the king of Judah. Ahaz was his name, a descendant of David. And he is at a crossroads, if you will, a crisis of faith. He is being challenged by two kings, the king of Ephraim, northern Israel, and the king of Syria. And they are saying, let us form an alliance together so we can fight off this unstoppable, momentous force named tiglath Pileser. History shows that the revived Assyrian kingdom was moving southwest towards the northern kingdom of Israel. And having conquered Israel, they would move down into Judah. And Ahaz is confronted with the decision. Will he trust in the counsel of these kings or will he trust in the counsel of the king? And God in his mercy sends Isaiah, the prophet, to come and offer this counsel to him. He's challenging Ahaz to not trust in the arm of the flesh. He's challenging Ahaz to trust in the promise of God. And Ahaz, who had already rejected the word of God, is then given a sign. If he won't hear, perhaps he will see. And so Isaiah brings with him his little son, a son with a, an interesting name. You can read about it in chapter 7, this Name that means a remnant will return or a remnant will repent. Shear Jashub. We know that from history, Ahaz rejected not only the word of God, but the sign that God had provided. And so then Isaiah is sent with another son in chapter 8. Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. I was never tempted to name any of my children that. One, because I have no sons, and two, even if God granted me a son, I would probably not call them that, but it was to be a sign and a portent for Ahaz to remind him of what happens when you receive the sign or you reject it. Ahaz rejected God's words and he rejected God's signs, and this two-edged sword of a sign brings either salvation if received or judgment if rejected. It brings judgment in the form of darkness, and that's where we pick up in chapter 9. That though Ahaz in his folly and rebellion had plunged the Davidic kingdom into darkness, God was not done. Because God's purpose before the creation of the world was to save him for himself a people in a Davidic son. And Ahaz had dropped the ball. And Hezekiah is going to drop the ball. And so this Emmanuel sign, this son that we're longing for, we're told by Matthew, is Jesus Christ. To those who are in darkness, light has dawned. To those who have been decimated by an enemy, a son is given. And those are my two points this morning as we work through the text. Verses 1 through 3, a light has dawned. Verses 4 through 7, a son is born. So let's look at this. A light has dawned. Verses 1 to 5. I have five little hangers for us to work through the text. Don't feel the need to memorize them. They just help people like me stay organized. And the first is desperation. Desperation. You see that in verse 1? But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. So we have here now a chastened nation. In the Old Testament, as went the king, so went the kingdom. Ahaz was the covenantal head of the southern kingdom. And so this king had rejected God and his sign, and God promised that he was going to bring decimation, deprivation, and desperation. We see that the nation is characterized not by light now, 
but darkness. And let me just put this forward for you. Your, light will, your life will always be characterized by darkness if you go on rejecting God's revelation. If you continue to reject God and who he is and who he reveals himself to be in the word and most ultimately in Christ, your life will be chaotic. It cannot but be chaotic. That is what happens when there is no light shining, darkness is reigning. Look at that in verse 18 of chapter 8. We're going to see contrasts here between those who reject God's revelation and trust in their own strength, darkness. To those who receive God's testimony and his promise and his sign, light will shine. He says to Isaiah and to the elect remnant who identify themselves with Isaiah as the faith community, bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord. This is what God's word causes us to do. It brings peace even in raging storms, and it brings flickers of light in the deepest of darkness. Here is Isaiah, like we read in Habakkuk who is confronted with the folly of a king who has rejected God and punishment and discipline is what is in store. And yet they hope in God's word. You may be feeling that you are in a world of hurt and darkness. To the testimony, bind it up, seal this teaching. Wait for the Lord who is the center and who is the subsistence here of this word. I will hope in him. Where does your hope come from? The word of God. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. We remember that God had always promised to deliver his elect people through a Davidic king in Jerusalem. Of course, you see that fulfilled in Christ, but even in the Old Testament, Isaiah, it looks like the Assyrian king, tiglath pileser he's going to de de demolish and destroy Jerusalem, but remember my promise that I have given in my word. Isaiah, understand that your children are not just signs to Ahaz, they're signs to you. Ahaz might reject your children. They might reject your son, but you are to receive them by faith, Isaiah, as signs and as portents that I will deliver my remnant. I will preserve my community of faith. Verse 19, Isaiah is tempted to fall into the counsel that Ahaz was following. Okay, and so just remember that, that the, the context into which light Dawns is darkness, a people who had rejected God and God in his mercy nevertheless still shines. Why were they in darkness? Because they had rejected God and his word. What does it look like to reject God and his word? Look at verse 19. And when they say to you, Isaiah, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire after their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Very interesting. So God's light shines through the promise of his word. And those who reject his word reject light and they have no dawn. All that they have is darkness. And we're going to see deep darkness. The people who reject the light of God's word and of his promise and ultimately of his presence in Christ, they will walk through the land greatly distressed and hungry. That's the picture. And I'm not thinking so much of a physical, though that happened historically, but of a spiritual. And people will run after anything and everything to satisfy their spiritual hunger. And they will follow after the insanity of Hinduism 
and of Eastern religions. And they will put their trust in all kinds of things that the scientific community presents to them. And they will trust in all kinds of broken crutches that cannot deliver. And it's insanity. They're walking around like dead men. They're zombies looking for something. And they will never find it because they have rejected the teaching. They will pass through the land greatly distressed. They're confused. They're hungry. And though God offers them the manna of his word, look what happens. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king. And I don't think it's much Ahaz, though, perhaps, but ultimately their king in heaven and their God. And they will turn their faces upward, but not in repentance, but rather with an upraised fist, and they will rage against him. Since they're not looking to the testimony, they will be looking and do understand that. You who have unbelieving family members, you have unbelieving neighbors and coworkers, they're looking. They really are. They're hungering and they're thirsting for something. And they will never find it until they find it in Christ. Their hearts will be restless until they find their rest in the true and the living God who has revealed himself in the testimony of the scriptures pointing to Jesus Christ. They will look to the earth. They will look to Oprah. They will look to blog sites. They will look to philosophy. They will look to university. And I'm not trashing this. I'm just saying, this is where I was. Looking for life in all the wrong places. Looking for light in all the wrong places. They will look to the earth. What does the earth offer us? Everything. What does the earth give us? Nothing but distress and darkness and gloom and anguish. This is your co-workers apart from Christ. Even with their two-week happiness of whatever they got for Christmas. This is their state. And this is why we must preach the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark world. I think of Philippians 2. We are to hold fast to the word of truth. In a dark and depraved generation among whom we amongst whom we shine as lights. Not my light. You have no light in you, Cliff, but Christ in you is the light. And as you preach it, it will turn their darkness to light, their gloom, as we're going to see to celebration. So that's the that's the context. Desperation. Darkness. Darkness in the Bible refers to evil, but also ignorance. And Christ is our only hope out of both of those. They are helpless and hopeless, looking for everything and finding nothing from the earth. Human resources will not get you out of your plight this morning. I don't know what your plight is, but it will not come. The deliverance will not come from you. It will not come from an Assyrian king. It will not come from a university degree. It will not come from a better job. It will not come from more books read. I pray to God that in his mercy, he will put you into a state of desperation. Because it's only on such desperate people that God's light will shine upon and be received. Do you, re- do you realize you're in darkness? May God in his mercy shine his light upon you. May he shine his light into your hearts in Jesus Christ. The message of Christmas is not try harder, you're almost there. The message of Christianity is that by nature we are not merely in darkness, but we are darkness. Remember in Ephesians 5? You were darkness. But in Christ, we are light, and we dwell in the light. Please do not tell people to try harder. Please tell them that they need Jesus Christ. Please tell them that the darkness is not just merely out there, but the darkness is ultimately in here, and that the help does not come from in here, but it comes from out there. That's the problem. I love how Alistair Begg often mentions it. The world says our problem is out there and our solution is in here. The gospel says that our problem is in here and our help is from out there. That light shines from outward in. You see it? 
it says that the light shines on. The light comes from heaven to earth upon a desperate people enshrouded in darkness. The second point, as we look at our first uh, umbrella of light has shined, is illumination. Desperation, illumination. I'm so thankful for Isaiah and his message of salvation after judgment. You end chapter 8, and it's pretty depressing. You begin chapter 9, and hope is restored and revived. The NIV picks up this with a better translation in 9.1, nevertheless. The ESV has but, and that's a decent translation, but it's a lot stronger preposition. You could translate it indeed, or perhaps even for. I like nevertheless. So we're in desperation at the end of chapter 8. Praise God for chapter 9. Emmanuel, God with us, and God is light. And so God is with his people, and so darkness will not forever reign. Nevertheless, but for indeed, there will be no gloom for who who is in anguish. Who is in anguish? The people who realize now that they are sinners like Isaiah in the presence of the Holy One of Israel. Upon these people light shines, who are in anguish over their sin. They're undone. I am an unclean vessel, Lord. No more gloom. In the former time, praise God that there's not just a former time, but a latter time. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That's the northern kingdom. Remember Pekah? He was the usurping king that Ahaz was so afraid of. God says, I brought them into decimation just as I promised. These two smoldering wicks, these two smoldering brands in the fire that have nothing. I brought them into contempt and I decimated them. But there's still hope. Why? Because we read the end of chapter 6 last week. There is still a stump. Though you cut down the tree, the stump remains and little branches will begin to grow. And God is not done with his people. That happened in the latter time, but there's going to be a time coming, Isaiah. There's going to be a time coming, disciples, when that land of darkness will be made glorious, when God himself is present in the land. And Matthew rightly picks that up. When Jesus Christ sets foot into the northern kingdom, he says, this was God coming into the promised land. Emmanuel, bringing light into the dark land, and that's Jesus Christ. So we move from desperation to illumination. In the Bible, God's presence is equated with light, and you can see that elsewhere in Isaiah and the Old Testament Scripture. There is light for these people because their sin and rebellion are not enough to keep God from manifesting himself to them. I was meditating on this last night. John chapter 1 for you quizzers and coachers, verse 3, is that when God wants to save his people, he describes it as light breaking into darkness. In him, in Christ, in this God was the life, and the life was the light of men. And you know what I love next? The light was shining, and the darkness has not overcome the light. The darkness cannot conquer it. And perhaps you feel that you're in deepest darkness this morning. God's light can conquer that. You don't need to be stuck in it. The light has overcome the darkness in the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is looking forward into the future from a prophetic point of view. I want you to understand that most of these verbs in this tense are past tense. Light has shone. And you're thinking, no, it hasn't, Isaiah. And in the Old Testament, a prophetic perfect was this, is that the, the prophet in a vision would be, as it were, transported into the future where he would look back into the past, which is still the future, and he would see what is happening in the future as already done in the past. That confuse you? It confused me, and I'm still confused. It's done in the eyes of God. It's a past tense promise, though it's, given in a future tense prophecy. 
because God is faithful. He has purpose to save his people in Christ. And though Ahaz and the people have sinned themselves silly into darkness, God is not done with his people. And he will, and he has shone upon them his light in his presence in the person of Jesus Christ. That way that is shameful is now made glorious. And in verse 1, it's picturing a return from exodus, from exile. Isaiah is picturing this restored remnant coming from Assyria and they're walking through the northern kingdom towards Jerusalem and the Lord is leveling every mountain and he's raising up every valley and he's bringing in this remnant and they're coming in now through this way that has been devastated and they look at it and it doesn't seem like much and God says, my presence in your midst will transform the darkness and shame into light and glory. And so this remnant is coming in. The true Israel is returning back into the promised land. And Matthew says that that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That the true Israel with God in the midst is coming in. And where Jesus Christ is, God's light is. And where Jesus Christ is, God's path is made glorious and clear. And I hope you see that. Illumination. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Jesus Christ says that I am the light of the world. If anyone follows me, he will not walk in darkness. Look at Luke chapter 1 and 2 quickly. Maybe I'll just turn there quick. I'll get into the third point, but I want you to understand that light in the Bible signifies God's presence and light in the Bible signifies God's salvation. And you're like, well, which is it? Well, it's both. Because where God is in his light, God is in his, is in his salvation. A Luke chapter 1, verse 76 and following. And you, child. Well, who is this child? Well, this is the child of Isaiah 9. And you, child, will be called the prophet of El Elyon, Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of his sins. Listen, we have salvation and forgiveness because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby, what? The sunrise shall visit us from on high to give what? Light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And so Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, seeing his pregnant wife bearing the prophet John the Baptist, is saying that you are going to prepare the way of the God who is light, and the God who in his light brings life and forgiveness of sin, and it shines in the darkness and guides people into the path of peace. You want to be guided into salvation, forgiveness, and the path of peace? It is only by the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must press on. Multiplication. Back to Isaiah chapter 9. We could spend a sermon on each of these points. That's not my goal. I encourage you to read through Isaiah sometime this Christmas season. We move from illumination to multiplication. We see that in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. Interesting, because there's only a small remnant left. And yet God has promised that he would always multiply Abram's seed like the sand on the seashore or like the stars in the sky. And so though they have been decimated, though the Assyrians and later the Babylonians and later the Persians and later the Romans have laid the land low, God still promises Israel a multiplication. Earlier, Isaiah reminded Ahaz that the people would be judged by God and only a stump would remain. And yet here he's promised now a great multiplication. It's a very important verb for most Hebrews. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis in creation and the promise to Abraham. And it's something they've always been longing for. And so we have these people entering into the promised land. 
but there's very few of them. And yet here, there's a multiplication. And I want you to be asking, well, how does this multiplication come to pass? And I will say, hold your horses, because that's our second point that begins with the word for. But there is a multiplication, which was always indicative of God's blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. Is this going to be a physical multiplication? Perhaps. Is it going to be a physical multiplication of physical offspring? Perhaps. Whatever it is, the nation is going to be multiplied, says Isaiah. And the reason it will be multiplied is because God is faithful to his promise, faithful to his covenant. And that this stump that seems like nothing will bear a multitude of offspring. And I would encourage you actually to read the end of Isaiah 53 and the beginning of Isaiah 54. I'll, I'll turn there because I think I need to go there just quickly. Because you're thinking, are they going to have lots of children? Maybe. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Who? Well, we'll see. He, Yahweh, has put him to grief. When his soul, his nefesh, makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Chapter 54, verse 1, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you have not been in labor. That's the small remnant that comes back into the promise and they're few. There's not much multiplying happening. But after Isaiah 53 and what happens in Isaiah 53, God says there's going to be a multiplication for the children of the desolate one. I take that to be Christ. Christ was never married. He never had any children. Ah, uh, I disagree. He has a spiritual offspring. The children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Make your tent bigger. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. That's the multiplication that happens when God's light shines on his people. Those who were in desperation receive illumination, resulting in multiplication and, fourthly, celebration. Isaiah 9. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. As a result of God's revelation of himself through this son, we will see who is the Messiah, joy sweeps over the people, reminding us that the true source of joy is God's presence. Maybe I'll apply that just quickly. Do you want your joy to be increased? Some of us can be very hard to be around. Just ask my wife. We can be miserable grouches. And the joy of the Lord is not our strength. Why? Because we've forgotten the salvation of the Lord who has presenced himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Why are they rejoicing? Because God has come into their presence in Emmanuel. He has come into their presence as this conquering king. And they don't just rejoice, but they rejoice before God who is in their midst. As with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil, it makes me think of David's own words when people are complaining against him. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In your presence, David says elsewhere, speaking of the resurrected Christ, is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Not under the tree, 
but on the tree. At the right hand of God, where Christ stands and manifests his presence to us by the Spirit, there is fullness of joy and celebration. And so I want you to rejoice with trembling. You might be going through a really difficult time, but God is with you, Christian. There can be that intermingling. Yes, the valley is still dark, but he's with you. That's why we love Psalm 23. His rod and his staff that have not only conquered your foes, but also comfort you. They're with you. The shepherd is near you. And the battle is won. We're just waiting for it to be fully realized. And so our celebration is one of faith. You might not feel like celebrating. You might think that the foe has not been conquered, but that's where we hope in faith. Christ is coming back and he's victorious. Think of the hundreds and hundreds of years where the Old Testament believers were reading this. They're like, what? That's why they're saying, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Ransom, captive Israel. They're still captive. And yet there's that rejoicing because these are past tense verbs. They're prophetic perfects. We can rejoice now because we believe. Verse four. So we had desperation, illumination, multiplication, celebration, and my transition is incarnation, which leads me to my second point. A son is born. A light has dawned, a son is born, and it's the same event. In the birth of this child, light shines. And we see that so clear in, in Matthew and Mark and Luke in their infancy narratives of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when this son is born, when this child comes to earth, light shines. And we see that there's a celebration because God dwells in the midst of his people in and through the Son via incarnation. A son is born. And I have four subpoints for this. I hope I'm not making you desperate for all the wrong reasons. I don't want to exasperate you, but this is God in the flesh. The first thing that the Lord put in my mind is gift. gift. Israel could not defeat their foes, whether in the form of Assyrians or Babylonians or Persians or, or the Greeks or the Romans or whatever it is, they could not do it. They needed outside help. They could not muster a big enough army. And that's okay because God says, my salvation, my light to you is a gift in the form of a helpless child. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. I love your name, Nathan. You know why I love Nathan's name? Natan in the Hebrew is the verb to give. Nathan's name reminds me of grace. Here are people in their ruinous plight, not merely outwardly from foes that are material or physical, but inwardly. They are in their sins and the darkest of night under, as it were, the judgment of God. And yet, as a gift of sovereign grace, he shines in the sun by giving him. This is the gift we need. It might not be the gift you want, but it is the gift you need. I still remember when I was younger, hair, no beard. I must have been 20, in my young 20s. And my mom bought me slippers for Christmas. Slippers. That's because my mom knows what I need. And she doesn't give me what I want. I probably wanted something that would be obsolete in two months. And I, they <laughs> I don't know. My dad must have a good sense. I, I was literally pointing at it with a, com with a complaining, murmuring, grumbling coming out. I'm like, Mom! And, and I have that picture stamped indelibly in my memory because I'm reminded that my mom gives me what is best, not always what I want. And this is what God gives a dark world. You might want a this or a that, but God gives you Christ. He gives you what you need. He's a gift. The second word is government. It's hard not to think of Handel's Messiah. I will not hurt you by trying to sing it. 
but the government is upon his shoulder. This is what Israel was always longing for and what the world was always longing for. Because as we work through Genesis in the new year, we're going to see that God was to rule over his creation by his vice regents, by his image bearers, by those who belonged to him, and they were to administer justice and righteousness. But because they were sinners, they couldn't do it as they ought. Israel was to be a light to the nations as they administered God's reign. And no king could, not even David. Even Solomon in the height of his glory was a sinner. Even the good ones like Josiah and Hezekiah. Read it. Hezekiah is great until he fears the Babylonians. And he has a show and tell party which Isaiah has to rebuke him for. Light shines on this child, on this son, on this Davidic king who has big shoulders, but not physically big shoulders because when the nation of Israel looked upon his physical appearance, there was nothing to marvel at. And I get that from Isaiah 51 and Isaiah 53. There's nothing comely about him. David at least was ruddy and good looking. Who's this one? Like, seriously? Give us someone strong. Give us a broad-shouldered king. And God says, I have. Perhaps in the new year, when we look at Isaiah 11 sometime, we're going to see that his shoulders can bear the government to rule the nations with equity and with truth and with righteousness and with justice. And with mercy, read Psalm 67. The world and even creation is longing for righteous rule. We all want good government. That's why we complain so much after elections. That's why we love to weigh in even when other nations have elections. That's why people fight so much over politics. Albert Moeller is right. We all have a utopian desire to be ruled for and over by a king. But it will be no earthly king. It will be a heavenly king who comes down to earth. And he's got broad shoulders, spiritually speaking. He's a gift, and the government is upon his shoulders. I see that also in verse 7, of the increase of his government, that his reign will not merely be over some small little geopolitical nation called Palestine, Israel, but it's a worldwide dominion psalm to ask of me, and I will give the nations to be your heritage, and the ends of the earth you will rule over. Your scepter will be much bigger than Ahasuerus. You will not just reign over, over Israel or Persia or the Middle East. You will reign over it all, the new heavens, the new earth. It will increase. And when it's fulfilled, Christ will return and set up this new heavens and new earth that Isaiah is longing for at the end of the book. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. That's the new heavens, the new earth, brothers and sisters. Christmas is so much more than just this helpless babe in a feeding trough for manger. It is our hope and it is the world's hope of a righteous reign. And God gives it. We don't elect it. We don't elect it. That's the hope. If we just had a better president or prime minister, if there's only more stability in the world, that is not our hope. Read 1 Corinthians 15. The Father is giving the world to the Son, and then the Son gives it back to the Father, and he rules over it as the perfect king that none of us could ever be. The third word, you're probably noticing a pattern. It begins with G. This son, this child is a gift. And he's characterized by governmental reign. Third, God. He's God. If you've been sleepy up until now, I pray that you'll have the strength to pay attention for five minutes because this is the meat of the sermon. Why is there such joy in the presence of this king? Because in the presence of this king, this Davidic king is the presence of God Almighty. In the reign of this king is the reign of God Almighty. In the presence of this king is a divine celebration. 
He only can multiply the nation. He only can give her increased joy. He only can despoil all of her foes because he's God. And the gov, I said I wasn't going to sing, and his name shall be called. Now remember in the Old Testament, a name meant character. This is who they are. This is their essence. Because some Arians or Jehovah's Witnesses, they see, how can Jesus be called the Father? No, he is fatherly. But we'll get there because that's not the first thing he is called. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. These are all doublets. The King James kind of breaks it up. Wonderful and then Counselor. I believe that there's four doublets. The first is wonderful counselor. And we will rip through it, I promise. It'll be quick. He is not merely wonderful, says one commentator, young. He is a wonder. He's amazing. Not only is his counsel amazing, he is amazing. Now this is rich because in chapter 8 you have counsel. You have counsel from Pekka. And then resin, right? They're giving counsel to Ahaz. This is how you get salvation. You join with us, and then we're delivered. This king, he is wonderful, and he gives wonderful counsel. And his counsel is this. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. That's the counsel. He offers you counsel on true salvation, not temporal salvation. Eternal salvation. His wisdom surpasses that of the greatest human king or council. Solomon has nothing on this king. This son of David makes the first son of David pale. Solomon's counsel is excellent, but he is not a wonder to behold. He is excellent in counsel because his counsel derives not from man, but from God because he is God. To designate the child with the word pele, that's the word wonderful, wonder, is to make the clearest attestation of his deity. Chapter 28, verse 29. God is the wonderful one. This one's wonderful too. Now, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the homeschool drawer. Kids are always pulling them out, and they're always broken off and dull. So when you have to make a quick announcement or write down a number, because I'm old school, I don't write it on my phone, I write it on a piece of paper, like Jonathan Edwards. Right, So I'm not the sharpest, but I, I can say, wait a minute, if God alone is wonderful and this child is wonderful, this child must therefore be God. You can wrestle with that. The next one is this. Mighty God. So you might be dull like me. I don't know how much clearer it gets. And yet the liberals love to say, oh, Gibberim just means a mighty warrior and El just means strong. He's super, super, super strong. Yes. And he's super, super, super strong because he's God of God. Not only as our creed says, but as the scriptures declare. He's mighty God. I'm just going to move on. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God is a gibberim. He is a mighty warrior. Yes, he came low and humble, But I guarantee you this, that the world will see Jesus Christ come the second time as mighty God, El Geberim. When he comes on his steed of victory with a flaming sword coming out of his mouth, he will not be seen as the helpless, innocent baby. He will not be seen as the crucified Savior. He is the conquering king. And that is our hope, because if he is not God Almighty in the flesh, how can we have any confidence that he can conquer our foes? The third doublet, he is everlasting father. Everlasting simply emphasizes the duration of the Messiah's reign. His reign shall have no end. Praise God that he's not elected in every four years. And he's not just going to reign for a thousand years. His kingdom and his reign is forever. That's your hope if you're in Christ. He will not be overthrown. He will not be deposed. He will reign forever and ever. So if everlasting emphasizes the duration of his reign, Father emphasizes or designates the quality of his reign. 
I don't know. I don't know why the hymn comes. But like a father, he tends us. There's that hymn. I'm probably getting a little bit wrong. Praise my soul, the king of heaven, I believe. This is how Jesus is. He is tender like a true father. Like Paul says to the Thessalonians, I I was gentle to you like a mother, but also like a father. In the Old Testament, kings were pictured as shepherds, but also as fathers. How is this king going to reign? He's almighty God, but what if he like flies off the handle like some of us bad dads? I don't want that. But what if he's tender and gentle and that power that exists within him, the power that exudes from him, what if that power is used on my behalf because he loves me and is gentle for me? And as a father, he will beat off, right? What would happen if if I jumped down and tried to take out Caleb? Caleb wants his dad to, to act like a father. Some of you are wanting to wonder what would happen. No, I, I, I will quash that. Nathan would destroy me. He is our everlasting father. He, he's not talking ontologically. He's not thinking of the Trinity here. So please don't go there. We're not mixing up the Trinity. He is the eternal son. But his reign over Israel is characterized as fatherly and gentle and protective. We need to move on. The last one. He is the prince of peace. He is the prince of of peace. He is the only one who can grant to us peace. My peace I give you. Not like the, the world's peace do I give to you, but my peace. A peace that I purchased at great cost to myself. Having therefore been justified by faith in Christ, we have shalom with God. Not merely the removal of enmity, but even more, we have this this, this fellowship and this union, this restoration with our creator, this princely one who rides out on his steed, purchases our peace. And I want you to see, as it were visually, that that's what happened when Christ carried his cross to Golgotha. He is riding his steed to buy peace for his people because it is our sin, says Isaiah later, that has made a separation between us and our God. He is our peace, Paul says in Ephesians 2. He himself is our peace. He doesn't just merely reconcile Jew to Gentile or Gentile to Jew, but he reconciles Jew to God and Gentile to God, and therefore Jew and Gentile in Christ to God. Oh, I hope you're praising him. We're longing for peace, and there will be no peace. Tell this to people. And they're saying, oh, if only this would happen. No, no, no. There is no peace for the wicked. You must be reconciled to this God and there is no other name given under heaven by which you must be saved, reconciled to God than Jesus Christ. He is God. He is God. The final word that comes to my mind, and I know I could say much more and I ask that you would be patient with me, is guarantee. That's the very last line of verse 7. How do we know this is going to happen? And we could say, yes, we know, because Marvin read Galatians 4, that at the fullness of time, God brought this child in, this, this, this gift of God's love and mercy and grace. Yes, he's born into time. But how do we know that he's going to bring in this everlasting reign? How do we know that he's going to conquer all of our foes? How do we know there's going to be an eternal uh, era of peace one day where there's no more weapons of warfare? How do we know that? God gives a gift. He puts his name on it. If you don't memorize verse 6 or 7, if you memorize this last line, it will do you a world of good to meditate on this. God makes promises and look what he does when he signs. How do we know this, God? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Lord of hosts magnifies his power. He's the Lord of heaven's army. Yahweh Saviot. 
When we sing, a mighty fortress is our God, Jehovah Sabaoth. That's what it is in the Hebrew. But zeal is a glorious word. It's a terrifying word if you're outside of this covenant, but it's a glorious word if you're inside the covenant. It has to do with a husband's jealousy for his bride. The NLT translates the Hebrew word excellent. It says the passionate commitment of the Lord of hosts. He is passionately committed to establishing the reign of this Messiah over his people who hope in his word. The New English translation translates it this way, the Lord's intense devotion to. How intensely devoted is God to his glory through this Messiah in the salvation of his people and setting up the new heavens and earth of an eternal reign? How devoted? He's intensely devoted. Some of us think we're passionate for the kingdom. We're not as passionate as this. And so appeal to God. You say that you are passionately committed to, that you're intensely devoted to this. So let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Christ is ruling at the right hand, but bring it down to earth, Father, by your passionate commitment for your glory and our good. Do it. The passionate Commitment of the Lord of hosts will what? Watch it? Wait for it? It will do it. Other translations will accomplish it. The best translation was the jealous love of the Lord of hosts will do this. Glorious. Glorious stuff. This is the gift that God gives us and the promise that he makes to us. Let me close uh, with something I stole from a book but I'll give the author credit after if you ask. He says this, for most people, Christmas is about receiving presents. But consider how challenging it is to receive certain kinds of gifts. So yes, this light has dawned in the person of this child, in the coming of this son, but this son is a gift The light that God gives us in Christ is a gift that must be received. So we are to receive presents. But there are different kinds of presents, he says. Certain kinds of gifts are more challenging to receive than others. And God is giving us a gift that will challenge us like no other. It is what we truly need. Not what we want, per se, until he makes us willing in the day of his power. But this is the gift that God gives us. Some gifts by their very nature make you swallow your pride. And so he uses an example. He says, imagine receiving from your spouse a book, one you don't like to read, and two, the title of this book is Overcoming Selfishness, Conquering Pride, How to Overcome Your Love of Money or Sports or Fill in the Blank. It's a message. She's giving you a message in the gift. In other words, some gifts are hard to receive because to receive it is to admit you have flaws and weaknesses and you need help. There has never been a gift offered to mankind that makes us swallow our pride to the depths that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. This gift of Emmanuel, the gift of this child, the gift of this son of David and son of God reminds us that we are so lost in our darkness, so helpless to find our way, so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than God's grace in Christ could ever rescue us from our plight. That's what people need to know at Christmas. Accepting God's free gift of salvation in Christ is simultaneously the hardest thing to do and the easiest thing. All I have to do is receive it? Yes, but before you can receive it, you must humble yourself. And that's a major theme in Isaiah. That God humbles the people. And finally, through his chastening, loving discipline, they realize that they're in darkness. And they have been humbled, and now they're ready to receive the gift. Receiving Christ is hard because we must confess and admit that we are helpless sinners, that we must be saved by God's grace, that doing more won't help us. 
We must descend and we must stoop if we are to receive. As Samuel Rutherford said, they used to have drawbridges. I don't know if, if you're familiar with them, but the, there'd be vessels, ships that would drive through, and they'd be taller than the bridge. And so they'd have to lift the drawbridge up so that the ship could pass through. God does not do that if you are to be saved. He does not make a way for you to enter in with your lofty pride. If you are to enter into the kingdom and receive the salvation, you must stoop. You must humble yourself and you must enter in as a beggar receiving God's free gift with the hand of faith. Bernard of Clairvaux says this, for those who never experience desolation, they cannot know consolation. Please, if you are in darkness this morning and you realize it, that's the gift of God because now you're going to ask for him to shine his light into your life. He says, and that is why people who live in the world, absorbed in its affairs, do not seek after mercy, for they do not feel their misery. Oh, when did this guy live? A couple hundred years ago? Oh no, Bernard of Clairvaux. He's an old church father. And the same struggle they had then is the same struggle we have now. He says, God's kindness has always been there, for his mercy is eternal. He had promised it to his people, but look, he no longer promises peace, he has sent it. He no longer predicts peace, he presents it. God the Father has sent a sort of sackful of his mercy to earth. We think of Santa with his sack of presents. Bernard of Clairvaux is saying the same thing, but in an exalted, reverent way. God the Father has sent a sort of sackful of his mercy to earth, a sack that must be torn open through Christ's suffering so that the price of our redemption may pour out of it. It is only a small sack, but it is full. That little child that seems so helpless reminds us of what God did in the days of Midian. 23,000, too many. 13,000, too many. 300. This is how God brings about his greatest victory. In the smallest, as it were, of helpless appearing vessels, he demonstrates his greatest victory over sin. And we celebrate that in Christ, in this helpless child who is full of mercy. And Father, we thank you for the light of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would shine now into darkness. There might be people here who are unconverted. May this be the moment where you shine into their life. May they no longer walk around stumbling to and fro, trying to make meaning out of life, trying to make sense out of their circumstances. May they see it clearly for the first time in Christ and that you actually have been working in such a way to bring them to an end of themselves that they might be desperate to cry out for illumination. And Father, that you would multiply Christ's uh, church even today, might celebrate Help us to receive the gift who is God, whose government will know no end, and whose reign is guaranteed to last forever. O oh, zeal of the Lord of hosts, accomplish this. Father, do it for the sake of Christ. Bless us and help us not to only receive this message, but help us to unashamedly and winsomely and lovingly tell others about Christ, the hope of the world, the light of the world. Father, we ask this in his name. Amen. Romans 6, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has set us free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For death, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What we have set before us this morning is a table that demonstrates the blood that Christ shed for us and the broken body of Jesus Christ. People, if Jesus Christ has entered into your hearts and has saved you, you are no longer under the bondage of sin. You have been freed. Your sins are forgiven, but no longer are you under the bondage of having sin as your master. Christ has conquered Satan. But the greatest gift of all is that he has also granted us, through his death and his resurrection, the ability to be with him in newness of life as well. He will resurrect us into a new body to be just like his. What Christ purchased for us on the cross was glorious. We need to celebrate it often and remember what Christ has done for us. It is amazing grace, and we must never forget. I'm going to ask Ryan if he'll pray for the bread and if Nathan will pray for the cup. Father, we thank you that the Christ who came into this world to save us was born in a physical body, that the virgin birth, Lord, is true. And we thank you, Father, for that in the fullness of time that this Christ was born of a woman and under the law that he might set free and redeem those who were slaves and under the condemnation of the law. So, Father, thank you that you didn't just give us a phantom, uh, that he wasn't just uh, a, a projection, but he was God in the flesh. And that we who have sinned in the flesh could be forgiven by a Savior who died on the cross in the flesh. And Father, we thank you. Even what Paul says, that what we could not do, being weakened in the flesh, Christ has accomplished for us by being crucified in his flesh on the cross. And so we celebrate it and we thank you for the gift of Christ, the God-man who died for our sins. Accept our, thank, our thanks, Father. Receive our praise. Uh, we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we remember your sacrifice for us, the shedding of your blood, we remember that how you stepped into this world. Though you were rich, you became poor. Though you are equal with God, though you are the very nature and essence of the God Almighty, yet you humbled yourself and you became a servant and you were cursed on the cross, not for anything in you, but for our sin. And we find cleansing today in that blood that was shed. And we pray that you would help us this day to take that cup of salvation and give thanks to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On that night when Christ instituted the table, he commanded them to take the bread and eat it in remembrance of him. Let's eat of the bread. That same night, he took the cup and he commanded them, drink this in remembrance of me. Let's drink. We have one closing hymn. Please stand with us. We'll sing, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
the words of that song echoing in our hearts. Let's go out and live for this great Savior who came, who is our hope and our strength. Let's pray one more time. Father, imprint these words, the words of your truth, the words of the Son who is given to us in our hearts. Strengthen us and may we go and give our life and our all to love and follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.